doesn't matter how the video performs. Obviously, I have best practices with regards to how my videos perform, but I look at it as a daily exercise, a daily discipline for myself to put out so much content every single day because I know that out of so much content, ones are going to hit, ones are going to do really well. And of course, you're going to have the ones that don't do as well, but it's more of a, you know, it's like weightlifting for people. People go weightlifting like every day or whatever. I don't resonate as well with that. I really should. I wish I did because I'd probably look more physically fit, <laughs> but I just have my discipline in another area and that's, you know, YouTube. So. Hello and welcome to Marketing Speak. I'm your host, Stefan Spencer. It is my pleasure to have Justin Rogers with us. Justin is a big YouTuber with over half a billion views. His channel is Forever Self-Employed. He has over 700,000 subscribers. He's also the co-founder of the fastest growing CRM in the service industry, Quote IQ. Justin, it's so great to have you on the show. Thank you so much, Stefan. It's a pleasure to be here. So we were we were chatting about all sorts of uh, fun stuff before uh, re recording here, things like synchronicity type uh, stuff, and and I just was curious to hear what is the most kind of serendipitous or s s synchronistic uh, thing that happened for you to you to get you to this place of being a huge YouTuber, and when you started, you were just you know, working for yourself, doing pressure washing. There must have been like some sort of miracle or something that happened. And it's like, yeah, this just, you, you can't explain this one away. <laughs> I don't know if I can pinpoint it back to one point. Uh, however, it was kind of like how everything unfolded in front of me. So I basically just kind of followed my intuition. Um, I started off, I was doing um, landscaping for uh, a landscape company. And I just realized this is something that I could do on my own. So that's when I kind of began my uh, journey of working for myself. And then from that point, I saw people on YouTube getting views, offering services and recording themselves, doing things that I was already doing, pressure washing, landscaping, things of that nature. I said, well, let's go ahead and start recording ourselves. And so started recording myself. And then before you know it, I started doing videos with other people. I met uh, my business partners now and slowly but surely everything just kind of unfolded in like the perfect way because I was always just following like the path of least resistance. So I don't know. I, I wish I could pinpoint it back and say it was this moment, but I've always just kind of like had the ability to kind of follow where I felt I should go. And then everything kind of unfolded from there. Hmm. Amazing. So your business partners now, do you feel like uh, they, they were kind of destined to be your business partners? Maybe you have a sole contract with them that they were, uh, you, you guys chose each other before incarnating or anything like that? I don't, I don't know if that specifically, I know uh, one, one of the guys was my first business partner, kind of like led me down this path of like uh, building out courses and selling info products to my audience, which opened me up to like a whole other world, which was incredible. I then took on another business partner who was with me for uh, a short span, probably about a year. And as soon as that relationship ended, I actually had another person come into my life and he's been an even better partner. And so it's just the way everything's unfolded very, it feels very like it was meant to happen that way. Even how me and you uh, met funny enough, like I was searching up, uh, as you guys heard, you know, we have quote IQ and I'm looking to, we built the website. We're trying to get some more traffic to the website. And so I was looking up SEO experts and I DM'd you and it just so happened that you had already seen, you know, some of my content and you asked me to come on the show and it's just very organic, you know? So now me and you are going to start, you're going to help me out with some SEO. And it's cool that I get to come on the, on the channel and talk about some cool stuff, you know? That's awesome. Like everything's so connected. <laughs> And it's just you follow the path and then things just come in your way. And I think that's kind of how you know that you're on the right path. You know, it's funny, though, at the time, like when that I had a business partner where a relationship ended, it was only about a year. And at the time, I thought it was like, you know, it was a considerable amount of income that I was relying on this person for. And it felt like the end of something, but really was the beginning because it created a space for somebody else to fill. And uh, that's my partner that I uh, started Quote IQ with. So I don't know. It just happened for a reason, you know. That's right. Yeah, everything does, I think. So, you know, one one thing I'm I'm really keen on this concept of 10x is easier than 2x. I'm reading the book, it's by Dan Sullivan and Dr. Benjamin Hardy, and it sounds counterintuitive that it's actually easier to 10x your business than 2x it because you have to think differently, be different, and most importantly, 
not do most of the things that you do now in order to 10x your business or your life or your relationship or whatever it is that you're trying to 10x or to you know leapfrog and so if it's let's say uh, a million dollar year business to get to two million feels like a lot of hard work a lot of uh, uh, late nights and just having to do a lot more but if you have to 10x then that means you got to be a different person. You can't operate with the same rules and same mindset that would get you to 2x. You have to like completely reinvent yourself and your business. And so this book has been just phenomenal. I'm, I'm really enjoying reading it and how I'm going to have to show up differently and say no to most of the things that I say yes to now and the things that I choose to do most of those things are going to have to go by the wayside. So I'm curious what, uh, first of all, have you heard of this book? Uh, and, and secondly, what do you think of that concept? And, and, and uh, thirdly would be like, give us some examples of you 10 xing your, your, uh, your business and your lifestyle. So, uh, Ben Hardy, I found him on YouTube a while back. I did see that book. I need to get it. Um, it reminded me of the Grant Cardone book, you know, the 10 X rule, um, and I just love that principle that it's easier to 10 X than it is to two X. I, it, it reminds me of like a Jim Rohn quote. When I hear about it, Jim Rohn always said like, become a millionaire, not for the million dollars, but for the person that you have to become in order to become a millionaire. And so I think it's kind of a similar concept of like, let us 10 X for the person that we must become to 10 X rather than you could kind of stay the same, you know, and kind of do the same things to two X. But I think in order to push your business that far out in front. I think you really have to become somebody else. So I love that concept. Uh, as, as far as me 10Xing, it's always been an opportunity of trying to find the opportunity of going for bigger markets. So when you work for somebody, the only way to earn more money is to become more valuable to that person. And at the end of the day, you're still earning them an income. So from there, I was like, okay, well, I'm only going to earn so much working for someone else. So let me work for myself because then I can then dictate my own price. I then set my own price for my own hours. I'm, you know, of course, there's more risk that comes with that. But then from there, once I had scaled a couple different service businesses, I'm like, okay, how do I go for more? And it's like, well, I want to leverage something that isn't my time anymore. Um, I don't want to be solely dependent upon my time in order to make money. And that's whenever I kind of shifted over to YouTube because I was like, I can make a video and it can live forever and it can work for me while I'm sleeping and it can, you know drive traffic and get ad revenue and all these different things that we love. So with regards to, you know, finding that, Going from 2x to 10x, it's always been a shift for me looking for bigger um, bigger markets to serve, I think is uh, – hopefully that answers. I don't know. <laughs> also, one other thing is mentors. I think that is incredibly helpful because if we think of like looking through um, like a, a lens, right? Like essentially if you're – this is where your current visibility is. When you 2x, you only just increase this by 2 times but when you get a mentor your vision goes like it just opens up and you can see so much more because they're not in your business you know they're they've taken out that emotional attachment and they they can just see more yeah and i i, I love what you're saying too about being able to uh essentially you're making money while you sleep with having a, a youtube channel that's monetized you don't have to go out and do another job. You don't have to win another client or, or a customer. You don't have to work extra hours. And, and that's, that's a mindset shift. That's, a ten, that's 10X thinking versus the 2X thinking, right? Well, what if I get somebody to, to, to work for me and help me with these landscaping jobs or help me with uh, the pressure washing jobs? No, you just went to re, complete reinvention. Which I think is brilliant. And it's a big leap. It's a big risk. Most people are uncomfortable doing that. What made you comfortable with uh, like reinventing yourself in that way? I think I didn't have a lot on the line for a while, right? So I was younger. I was living with my parents when I, whenever I first kind of started along this journey. I was actually in college too. Um, that's one thing is like they just, my parents like guilt tripped me so much to go to college and follow this path of like, this is what people do. They go to college, they get the good job. And it just wasn't for me, but I didn't make that excuse for myself. So I was just living with them. I went to college, but I also had my businesses and um, I just leveraged the fact that I didn't, I didn't have a family. I didn't have a mortgage. I didn't, 
I actually drove a van around. I drove like a, a, a big uh, white van. It was kind of, it would be embarrassing for most people, but honestly, I embraced it. I loved it. I actually put like some subwoofers in there. I made it my own. It was cool. Um, but I just didn't overextend myself with how much money I was making. And it allowed me to take chances and, and, and you know, create my own opportunity as well. So um, I also credit my dad a lot. My dad was always like, just go out there, make it happen. If you make a mistake, then we'll, we'll you know, make an adjustment and we'll find a different way. Um, he didn't necessarily see YouTube as well. I wish I would have started earlier, but, uh, anyway, I just, I feel like I, I did it early on. Um, and that's what I always encourage people to do. Also, if you, if you wanted to do the same thing and, and you're over leveraged with a job and a family and everything, you got to find time at night, you got to find time early in the morning and you just got to make it happen slowly, but surely until you can replace income, you know? Yeah. Yeah. And you, you have to, uh, see that there's a compelling future and believe in yourself enough to know that that's like an inevitability. If you, if you want to be a best-selling author, you've got to see that as real. You know, it's the law of attraction. The law of attraction does not work if you just imagine that there are checks showing up in the mailbox and the bills have stopped. You actually have to feel the feelings of what that's like. And I'm being hypothetical here, whatever that that huge 10x or 100x goal is that you have, if you see that as inevitable and you step into that future version of yourself that is experiencing it and feel those feelings, you know, there's an actual feeling uh, of success. BJ Fogg, who is a past guest on this podcast, he, he coined the term shine to refer to that, that emotion of feeling successful and, and people will stop doing uh, what they'll, they'll, they'll take on a habit and then they'll continue that habit if they're feeling shine. And if they're not feeling shine, they will, they'll drop the, the new uh, habit. And if somebody is, um, uh, you know, not, not feeling that, that shine, they're, they're not going to be motivated to keep going. So, you know, we t we're talking uh, be before the recording about uh, Bob Cialdini and his book Influence, which you're reading now, and and uh, Bob knows this very well. That how people are are motivated to uh, to, to do things and what what um, sort of principles uh, under uh, underpin those motivations. It's uh, yeah, fascinating stuff. So I'm I'm, I'm curious. Uh, to hear how you are incorporating uh, principles of like influence and and um, better habits and uh, personal development, self improvement sort of stuff in into your life and into your business to make that next ten x leap. Right. I completely agree. Just to uh, go back and touch on the other point, I think my dad kind of gave me a little bit of a superpower because. At the time, I was I was doing a bunch of stuff with my dad and starting a couple of different side businesses with him, and he was helping me a lot. And like a lot of what I did was is a lot of work up front with no guaranteed return. So I don't have a problem even to this day putting in a lot of upfront work with no guaranteed return. So we talked earlier on about how we built the CRM. It's like, well, you can build it, but that doesn't mean anyone's going to actually purchase it or use it or anything to that extent. So I'm always okay with taking on the time investment for no return but knowing deep down within myself that that it will succeed and knowing it so greatly that nothing will ever push me off of that path. I don't know. That's something that I've always just kind of stuck to. With regards to influence, man, that book has so much great stuff. One of the, uh, I'm on the, I'm only, I'm about to finish up with the second chapter, but it's uh, about the law of reciprocation and how, you know, um, when a gift is given, uh, people actually feel the need to reciprocate and they'll reciprocate by giving more or, you know, purchasing more. So I don't know. I'm always just trying to like ha figure out how I can make an offer better, how I can offer more value up front um, in exchange for more on the back end and, um, you know, just kind of leveraging relationships. So as far as key, uh, as far as that book goes, I would say uh, reciprocation is where I'm at currently and kind of like, that's how we bring customers into our business, right? It's, it's a gift of something. Oftentimes, you know, there's a lead magnet, there's something that was given for free, you take advantage of it in exchange for information and in return, you know, that company's going to market to you and things of that nature. So uh, the coolest thing about that book that I love is, is every principle is matched with an example. 
Um, and I just think more books should copy that. I literally highlight almost the whole thing of every page because <laughs> it's just so good as I'm going through it. Yeah. yeah. And what we were saying about reciprocity or re reciprocation that um, I, I think is, this is an example from an, another internet marketer, uh, Frank Kern. He talks about results in advance. And when you can give somebody uh, a result for free, then that law of reciprocity really kicks in. And, and when you present an offer to them of a paid program, they're much more inclined to say yes to that and to associate the value that they received already for free from you with the value that they received from the paid program. So they're just lumping it all together and say, oh yeah, the best investment I ever made was uh, buying that 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 uh, YouTube coaching program with Justin, because you know I just completely transformed my uh, my business and my YouTube presence and everything. And maybe they got the best stuff for free from you, and then paid for the whole rest of it. But they associated all of it, including the the free stuff, with uh, the the results that they got. So yeah, he calls that results and give them results in advance for free. Uh, for example, he, he likes, he, he liked to share this one of like a course on how to play the guitar and the freebie, the, the free lead magnet portion or whatever would be, let's say how to play the F chord. If somebody masters the F chord and they were struggling before and they got that for free from you, they feel that sense of shine, that feeling of success, right? And they want to partake in, in your offer of the entire course, master the guitar and not just learn how to play the F chord. So they sign up and they associate the value of what they got for free and playing the, uh, learning how to play the F chord from, uh, from you as well as all the other stuff in the course, in the paid course. I love that. I love that principle. That's pretty much my whole YouTube channel. So, uh, we sell a bunch of info products on the channel, which just take people much deeper, puts things in a linear format for them. But that's the whole basis of everything is provide value up front and offer a product along with that. And like you had mentioned before, people that have found a lot of value, they'll want more and they'll be attracted to the paid product. And, you know, that's how it goes. Me and you did an introductory call and I loved it so much. I told my partner, I said, we have to, we have to do an SEO, um, you know, call with you and a paid call. So, there's something to be said about the law of reciprocity. One of the coolest things, well, uh, I was I was reading it the other night, and it was um, this hotel had done a study and basically saw like offering a perfect um, experience to the customer actually didn't get them as good of, of reviews as offering a flawed experience to the customer, but then making it right. And so they gave this example of this lady that wanted to play tennis and, and she was, there was no tennis rackets for her kids because, you know, they were all being used currently. And, and the hotel staff said, don't worry about it. We'll get, we'll send somebody out and uh, we'll get them to go get some new tennis rackets for you guys. So they got the new tennis rackets and brought them back. And then the lady booked a whole holiday stay for her entire family because the hotel had gone out of their way for them. But it was just so crazy. The fact that like offering a perfect experience to somebody, they won't value it as much as a flawed experience that is made perfect. Like, I just love that principle. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And of course, you know, perfect is the enemy of done. And so if, if you're waiting for perfection in anything, you're going to wait a very long time. Uh, I, I forget who I heard this from, but uh, it's a great quote that a, a perfectionist basically is the same as somebody with no standards. Oh, wow. Because nothing gets done any, either way. Right. No, right. Nothing of any real value gets done either way. Yeah. Just kind like, of a cool, uh, uh, like a side to this is uh, I was watching a video the other day and it was on Picasso. And um, I'm not sure, I'm, I'm pretty sure it was Picasso, but Picasso apparently painted like two or three paintings a day for his entire life, even up, to, up until the day that before he died. And he had amassed like 50,000 paintings and you only hear about a select few that, you know, sell for a tremendous amount of money. You don't hear about all the other paintings that he created, you know? So it just kind of goes to show that like perfect is the enemy of good. Is that, isn't that the saying, Stefan? Something like that. Perfect is the enemy of done. Yeah. Or done, of done. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, cause imagine if he had tried to perfect everything, he might've only created like, you know, a thousand pieces. But instead, he had 50 times that amount. And, you know, some of the most famous art that we have today is from Picasso. Mm -hmm. Yeah.
pretty incredible. I look at the same thing with my YouTube channel. I'm like, doesn't matter how the video performs. Obviously, I have best practices with regards to how my videos perform, but I look at it as a daily exercise, a daily discipline for myself to put out so much content every single day because I know that out of so much content, ones are going to hit, ones are going to do really well. And of course, you're going to have the ones that don't do as well, but it's more of a, you know, it's like weightlifting for people. People go weightlifting like every day or whatever. I don't resonate as well with that. I really should. I wish I did because I'd probably look more physically fit, <laughs> but I just have my discipline in another area and that's, you know, YouTube. So, yeah, you know, I, I, I learned from the book 10 X is easier than two X that Mr. Beast uh, was coaching his um, students on this principle of focusing on just a small number of videos to make better than anything else on the internet in that niche or topic. And it doesn't have to be twice as good. It just needs to be at least 10 or 20% better than the best that's out there. And if you just laser in on these handful of videos, instead of trying to do every video better, you know, every video uh, with maybe double or 10 times the uh, the view count and watch time and, uh, and, and the audience retention graph being 10 times better or whatever. If instead you just laser in on a small, small number of videos, that will transform your whole uh, channel and business. And I, I just think that... Uh, that resonates on so many levels. And I think it's applicable, not just to YouTube, but um, to business and to life. Absolutely. Absolutely. I, I would love to go back to before Mr. Beast had gotten on YouTube and just go take a look again, because if you just look at the progression of Mr. Beast, like the production quality of these channels has gotten to where it's like, you have to almost produce a TV show now to get like, you know, to garner a ton of attention, either that or it's gotta be something, you know, crazy or, um, new to people, but, um, uh, I love what Mr. Beast has done. I think he's very inspirational, uh, just from garnering, being able to garner so much attention, you know? Yeah. And he knew when he started that he would be one of the biggest YouTubers on the planet. He just knew that that was a destiny. That, that was an inevitability. Right. It's just, just like we were talking about before, he just followed the path and just continued on and, you know, had that vision of what it was going to be in the future, even when everything was bad. And he was able to see it through. It's either you die or you, you keep going until you get there, right? Like, Yeah, there's no such thing as failure. Stevin, what do you think about this? Like, as far as Mr. Beast goes, like, I feel like there's a place you would reach that would be kind of the pinnacle. So Mr. Beast is at the top. I wonder how, like, you continue to be happy even with all of that success. Because I think a lot of us gain our happiness from a projection into the future of where we think we can go and how we think that would make us feel. But being the one at the top, I wonder if, I mean, obviously you have to have more of an intrinsic happiness, but how do you feel about that? Like, I think you're one of the top of the SEO game. So like, you know what I mean? It, well, so I, I separate out ego from like my my soul knowing. So my ego would feel uh, like, I don't know, a, a disappointment or, a, well, is this all there is after hitting some major milestone? But here's the secret is if your soul knows that you're just here to experience and you're here to grow and you're here to cleave to God, to uh, become one with him and to, to like just shed the illusion uh, of separation, and then it's all just a beautiful, elaborate video game, and you're just having fun doing it. And there, there is no big letdown because you finally hit the pinnacle. And like, now what? Those people who get uh, really depressed after they hit a major milestone or sell their business or whatever, have a big check come. I think there, they were, you know relying on ego and not uh, tapping into their soul's mission. So that's my guess. I mean, I've certainly been uh, disappointed after hitting major milestones prior to my spiritual awakening. And, and that's how I see it now is looking back. It's just, you know, it was, uh, that was all part of the experience of um, recognizing that ego is not where, everything is at that's just you know it's a it's a big letdown 
I've been trying to make a conscious, deliberate effort to celebrate small wins. And sometimes I'll just, I just had this tendency of always pushing it out a little further, a little further. If we can just get here, if we can get there, it's going to be great. And then I like, I sit back and reflect and I look around and I'm like, man, you know, I got a beautiful home, a family, like this is really great. I'll look back. I hear this saying all the time. It's like, you know, if you were 60, you'd pay any amount of money to be back young and healthy again. And I just try to sit and like reflect in that and resonate with that and just say, no matter no matter if I had a nicer car in the driveway or I was in a better house, like this is like, it's great right now, you know? So I've been trying to get better at celebrating when I do get the, to the 10 X, but I've also been trying to do better of also enjoying that journey because I think you can get so tunnel visioned that, um, that's why it's so empty on the other side, you know? Yeah. Yeah. I, I hear you. You know, it's like, if you don't celebrate your wins, then for one, you're not, motivating your your reward center of your brain to keep going and do more and secondly you're not being grateful to the creator for the abundance that you've been given it's kind of disrespectful so celebrating i think is a is a requirement and and also I think that if you want to try and live in both worlds simultaneously of the physical world and the metaphysical, the spiritual or the ethereal, try to have this uh, sense of you're watching yourself as this time is playing out right now. Like we're on a podcast uh, having a conversation and I could just imagine my soul watching this moment you know, kind of like the, you have the, the, the near death experience. Uh, some people have where they'll, they'll, they'll see their whole life flash in front of their eyes. It's called the life review and they'll see, Oh yeah, I remember that moment. Oh, I wish I wouldn't have said that thing and all that sort of stuff. And it happens like in a flash, but it's a whole lifetime just playing back. Imagine having that happen, but you're watching it from the, I don't know, from the ceiling, <laughs> watching this moment unfold. So it's like, my kid is really wanting me to put the phone down and and read him a story. Am I going to do this important email because it really needs to go out now and and neglect my son? Or am I going to put the phone down and put my 100% of my attention to him? What's my soul going to think of this moment or feel about this moment looking back in a life review, you know, floating at the top of the ceiling? I like that perspective. I think that's super cool. The other thing is, is I think on the other end of that 10 X, you know, we, we place the prize at the other end, but when you think about it, all you really want is the feeling of the accomplishment. So that's when I try to like, remember that. And I, and, and I try to feel the accomplishment is already being done because at the end of the day, that's all I wanted anyway, was just this magical feeling. I thought that I was going to have, I think that's a beautiful place. I don't think anybody that's like in the beginning of their journey should do this. Like, in the beginning, it's more like you just have to hammer in, hammer in, hammer <laughs> Hustle in. Hustle and grind. <laughs> That's right. That's You got to do whatever you can to get ahead, right? But then I think once you get to a certain point, it's it's kind of a, the law of diminishing returns, right? Like, you know, I, I just think you have to enjoy the journey. I completely agree. I love that perspective of trying to think into the future. And I do that all the time, trying to project myself and think like, what am I going to think about this? Yeah. Well, you know, Ben Hardy has a, a book all about this called Be Your Future Self Now. Oh, that's beautiful. I love that. I love it. I've done a lot of that as well, that I I have thought about who I wanted to be. And then I've tried to create that person in the now and try to think like that person, speak like that person, act like that person. Andrew Tate, I saw this video on Andrew Tate where he um, he does this self-hypnosis where, you know, people obviously have their own opinions on Andrew Tate and the things that he says and, and that nature. But the things that he says aligns with who he wants to be. And so every time he speaks, he then comes more in alignment with that and he's self-hypnotizing so even though he might not make hundreds of millions of dollars he might say it and it and then it becomes to be because he's aligning with that person so i just i love that kind of stuff mm -hmm. yeah amazing so um let, let's go back to those early days when you were working at a landscaping company and uh, and maybe even just starting off on your own self-employed doing pressure washing doing landscaping what are the the mindset shifts or the uh i don't know the the 
the nuances that make all the difference for somebody who might have even a YouTube channel and be doing landscaping or drainage or, or shoveling snow, whatever, right? I actually have a client that's a landscaping company. So what would you tell somebody who's in, in that kind of world building uh, a business or, or you know, a career doing you know, manual uh, labor for others and you want them to, I don't know, make that huge uh, leap forward. What are some of the things that would make a difference like for their YouTube channel, for their business, for their mindset? So first and foremost, like we talked about before, I think getting a coach because there's someone who's taken the path and that is on the other side of the path. And the funny thing is, is we actually do a lot of coaching. So like, like I said, we sell info products on the channel. We have a coaching group uh, called the inner circle, which is like, we, we do calls on here and stuff like that. And a lot of times I'll see people follow down the same path that I went down of like realizing the opportunity, starting to work towards that opportunity. And eventually they get to a point where they've kind of maximized in their business and then they start looking for another one. So I think it's always kind of, you know, monitor yourself. Obviously, I think get mentors, get people that are uh, that have done what you want to accomplish and then also get, you know, uh, extra training buy courses. I love extra info products and things of that nature. I always try to think in terms of like, uh, I hate to say this, my mom and my stepdad every night, they, they sit on the couch and they watch a new series. And, um, I think about how much time in their life they have spent watching new series on television. And I try to think to myself, like, it kind of makes me sick. Cause I'm like, I need to be taking the time every night to become a little bit better in the direction in which I hope to go. So for anybody who's in that situation, like where you're just starting off in whatever field it is, like you can get free training on YouTube. I would just be very cognizant of what media you're consuming when you're consuming it. I'd get off of Netflix. When I was doing pressure washing and stuff, Stefan, I was studying YouTube. I would literally six, seven hours a day listen to how to grow on YouTube, how to grow on YouTube until it was so ingrained in me that things just start aligning and connecting. And now I can see things that I couldn't see before. So um, I would just employ anyone to learn from people that have done what you want to accomplish. And um, you're going to be fast tracked. You're going to be way ahead of everybody. You know, I'm sure you've seen that as well, huh, Stefan, like with SEO and stuff. Yeah. Yeah. So do you see a difference between a coach and a mentor or are those pretty much synonymous? I'll be honest. I'm having, um, a coach and a mentor, I feel like they're kind of synonymous. I don't know. Uh, I, I guess I guess mentorship is a little bit different. It'd be a little bit more like one-on-one, right? At least that's what I feel like. And I feel like coaching could be like a course or something of, of that nature. I haven't had a ton of success with mentors. I've paid people for calls and things of that nature. Um, but I don't know. Maybe I just need to dig a little bit more deeper into that. But coaching, definitely. I've bought all kind of courses. I've studied a whole bunch of stuff, read books, you know, things of that nature. What about you, Stefan? Can you can you speak to what the difference is? Well, my understanding of it is a mentor kind of takes you under their wing and uh, they're mostly not paid for it. Oh, really? Okay. Yeah, that's my understanding of it. And uh, I don't really have a lot of mentors or have had a lot of mentors I can point to that would be like, oh, this person took me under his or her wing and taught me the ropes and so forth. And no, I just, uh, I pulled myself up by my own bootstraps, but I got a lot of coaching by hiring coaches and paying the money and uh, buying courses and and books. And uh, I'm always learning, always learning. So yeah, I think it's more of a, you know, in a, someone who's investing in you it might be a mentor because they they don't get monetary compensation but they take you under their wing because they like who you are what you stand for what you're up to i would love that i don't know how you'd find one of those uh but also i think people also need to pay to a certain extent because when you pay you pay attention and i love that statement i've <laughs> i say that a lot when you pay you pay attention Unless you have some skin in the game, you're not really going to probably, you know, do everything that the mentor is saying. So I don't know. I don't know. I, I would love mentors. I love the idea. I get tons of DMs from people that probably would love to for me to mentor them, but I'm not in a space. Maybe if I was like 70, you know, like, but 
it's it's a pay to play deal, you know. So if you want the best information, you gotta pay. And um, I don't know if anybody knows anybody that watches this knows where to find a good mentor at, then please let us know, you know. Yeah, if, if uh, Mr. Beast or Casey Neistat want to mentor you, you'd be interested. <laughs> I just always think in terms of how valuable someone's time is. And so for somebody who's va- whose time is super valuable, it's like at the end of like, dude, you know, it's, um, it would almost feel greedy of me to be trained for, you know, for free by this person because, you know, I don't know. I could see if it was like maybe an apprenticeship or something, you were learning a trade, but even then, like there has to be some sort of value exchange, either, either that or you might be a leech, you know? <laughs> yeah. Uh, so what are some of the practices, best practices for YouTube that really move the needle? Uh, is it thumbnails? Is it titles? Is it playlists? Uh, is it uh, uh, production value on the videos? Is it the hook at the beginning of the video, like the first 20 seconds of you know the, 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 the video? Uh, is, is it the end cards? Like what, what's, what's kind of the secret sauce here? So I think the first thing to, to you know, recognize is that there's two ways that people find you on YouTube. The first is browse and the second is search. And so I think in order to have a, a good balance with your channel, you really have to have a blending of the two because essentially searching is evergreen content, right? It always feeds into the channel, but you also need to have browse because those are the videos that can explode and get tons of views. So having a blend of both is is the best way to go. Then you have like, niching so i i asked you earlier why did you blend your channel with two different podcasts because ideally people that are interested in spiritual probably or maybe they are interested in business but i don't know if that's you know a crossover that you would necessarily want so you'd want to cater to one specific audience right you'd want to make sure you have browse you want to make sure you have search content and then when it comes to the video obviously there's best practices with video the front end needs to hook And then the video needs to retain people for the longest amount of time possible. And then with regards to thumbnails and titles, those are your click throughs. So essentially the perfect video would have a hundred percent click through rate, meaning every person the video is presented in front of click the video. And then every person who clicked the video watched all the way until the end, that video would be viewed by every single person on YouTube. So when people are like, oh, you know, the YouTube algorithm doesn't like me or whatever the case may be, it's like, well, really, you're not doing a good enough job of getting the click and you're not doing a good enough job of holding the attention for long enough into the video to send the signal to YouTube that this is a good video. And essentially that's how every algorithm works, which is the crazy part. So when you're talking about TikTok, when you're talking about YouTube, when you're talking about um, Instagram, all these platforms just want longer retention, longer time on platform. So If you can figure out how to make somebody click through and watch all the way into your video, you got a recipe for, you know, a lot of success. Now, if it was that easy, it's a little bit harder than that. But if it was that easy, everybody would be good at it. But um, figuring out what those things are that make people do that is uh, probably the hard part. You know what I mean? (laughs) How do you systematize this to go about optimizing for the the hook and the retention the click through all that, like, are you AB testing your thumbnails and your titles? Are you doing any kind of, uh, uh, focus groups or, uh, surveying your audiences? Like, how do you, how do you dial this in? So the beautiful thing is that YouTube has already surveyed, uh, your audience. So if you type in whatever the keywords to whatever video it is that you're going to make, you can see what videos have the best titles, the best thumbnails, by seeing which ones pop up first and which ones have the most views. And then from there, it just kind of becomes a game of, okay, well, we're going to recreate this. Or, you know, you could reinvent the wheel, but why? You know, I think um, Tony Robbins says success leaves clues. It might have been Tony Robbins, I think. So um, that's something that I do a lot, right? So if I have an idea for a video, I'm actually going to search up the keyword. I'm going to see who's ranking one and what the titles look like. So that way I can kind of backwards engineer it. And then with regards to my structure on the video, I've started treating the first 30 seconds as a short. So a lot of people know that short form content is like very punchy, right? So I want that hook to be really punchy. I'm going to tell you exactly, um, you know, what the video's plans are. Um, I'm just reaffirming to the the viewer that, you know, they've clicked on this video for this purpose and I'm going to serve that purpose. And then another thing that I've been doing for anybody who listened this far into the podcast is I like to put a carrot out. So I say, hey, if you stick around until the end, I'm going to give you this super cool thing. And so I throw the carrot out 
to increase my retention. Another thing that I did was, um, and I did this early on, I had this thing called the word of the day. So anybody who watched until the end of the video, I would give the word of the day. And if you made it this far in the video, comment down below the word of the day, and I will I say hashtag you a real one, but it's essentially just me acknowledging that you made it this far in the video, and I appreciate you for doing so. And so having that back there, a lot of people knew that it was back there, which would increase retention, but it also increased my engagement on the video. And so um, it was kind of twofold a little bit. And so if you have another little trick here is if you have pitches in the video and somebody makes it to the word of the day, you know that that person got hit with either one of one or two pitches. So I would always place the word of the day after the second pitch, and I know that you know they got hit twice with it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so <laughs> little tricks of the trade, if you will. So yeah, I I definitely do that. Definitely look at who's been successful. How do we you know recreate that success? Front end of videos needs to be very hooky. Throw out the carrot to increase retention, and um, that's kind of you know that's kind of the formula. Yeah, and are you investing a lot in shorts or? Uh, it's mainly just the, the, the longer form, uh, longer form content videos. So I got into short form, um, really early and I was actually probably the first person who had a service industry, uh, first service industry person who got into shorts. And so there was this guy who was doing like, he was making subway sandwiches and he was just talking behind the video. And I was like, I could do this. And so I just started talking behind like these videos of me pressure washing. I talked about customer experiences and I talked about all the little hot button topics that I knew got people, you know, a little triggered. And so I actually was hitting the um, YouTube has, um, what is it called? They have like a page for like the, the best videos of the day, like the viral videos. And I was hitting that like a couple times, like over and over and over again until people saw that I was having a ton of success and they started kind of oversaturating the market a little bit. So now I just look at it as like, I need so many executions a week because those short form content has a much greater possibility of popping for me, much greater than my longer form. So um, I just kind of keep it in the rotation now. But early on, I mean, it took me from my first 100,000 followers probably um, to 300,000 followers in like a couple months. Like I was just absolutely booming. Wow. <laughs> Congratulations. Yeah. So thank you. I appreciate it. It's just, it's just putting yourself in an opportunity. What do they say? They say, um, uh, luck is when opportunity meets, um, I, I mean, opportunity meets preparation or something. So I was prepared. I saw the opportunity and I executed and, you know, first people get the reward. So I'm always looking for that. Like if there's any new features to any platform, you can almost be guaranteed that you're going to get some kind of reward for kind of going into that feature because they want to, you know, yeah. they want to put it out in front of more people. So yeah, yeah. Luck is when preparation meets opportunity. There you go. Yeah. Perfect. So it's attributed Perfect. to, to uh, Seneca, a Roman philosopher. Oh, really? Okay. Have you ever heard of uh, Ty Lopez, Stefan? Yeah. So Ty has this like remarkable ability to like pull different thoughts into his head. Like he knows so many statistics and I never knew how, the, how he did this, but uh, I was watching this guy named Myron Golden. Have you ever heard of Myron? No. He's a public speaker. He's on YouTube. Uh, he's really good, but he was talking about how he studies books. And so he would go through, he'd read a book, he'd highlight everything. And then not only did he highlight it, but he also would take a sticky note and then he would take the highlighted portion and then rephrase it in terms that made sense to him. So he would then take that rephrasing and he would put it into a Google doc and then he would study it. So that way, when a situation arose there, where there was like something to be pulled from that, he could just take it from his memory because he would study the Google doc. So I'm going to start doing this within, you know, uh, my own, I'm going to start practicing this myself because I think it's pretty cool. You know? Yeah. That reminds me. I a long time ago, watched a video of Rich Sheffron explaining his process for uh, learning and how he would read books and highlight and then cut the binding off, pull the pages out that were highlighted, take those, only those pages that had highlighting uh, and t put it in a, a separate um, like bound thing. And then uh, all these books on, on the like same kind of topic would be bound together just those pages that had his highlighting on it. And he would be able to speed read through those and uh, consume a ton of information. The second go round and really reinforce his learning. That's one of my favorite things is being to re being able to reread a book that I've highlighted. Cause it's like, I get the best stuff just right away. You know, it's incredible. Yeah. Well, you know, there's a, a tool called Readwise, 
that when you're highlighting in Kindle, it will take those highlights and use it as fodder to give you uh, like quotes and, and little nuggets, for, uh, uh, wisdom nuggets from those books that you've read on a daily email. Oh, wow. That's cool. That is so cool. It is awesome. It is so, so cool. So I, I get the daily Readwise uh, email. I, I read it today, in fact. And uh, I don't know if you're a fan of uh, Paulo Coelho, uh, the author of The Alchemist, but I love that book. And uh, a, a couple of quotes that came in today from The Alchemist. Here's a, gr- a great one. There must be a language that doesn't depend on words, the boy thought. I've already had that experience with my sheep, and now it's happening with people. Right? So it's that still, small voice. You're just hearing that kind of telepathically uh, the, the ideas uh, come in, flow in from uh, your environment, from people that you're in communication with. Uh, or, or in collaboration with that. So it's just spurs on these, these uh, um, thoughts and ideas that you might not have, re- you might have read that book 10 years ago, but it just kind of bubbles the wisdom up to the surface on a daily basis. Just little nuggets. Are you more of a Kindle reader or do you like more of a physical book? I prefer a physical book, but of course, I can't get Readwise to work on a physical book. So. Right. <laughs> right. But even if I don't highlight in the the Kindle book and I just tell it the names of the titles of some of my favorite books, it will take other people's highlights and it will bubble those up to the surface and, and give those to me in a daily email. Okay. I'm definitely I'm definitely gonna go to this podcast is sponsored by Readwise. <laughs> <laughs> readwise.io that's a great segment yeah yeah it's a great tool uh, and they also have a, a a bookmarking app called readwise reader and i i used to use pocket as my like uh, chrome extension a safari extension that i would bookmark stuff with but readwise reader has an ai that will uh, they call it ghost reader instead of ghost writer it's your ghost reader that reads it and summarizes it and takes key points and and kind of you know, surfaces that to the top and it will be on whatever piece of content you're, you're consuming and you've bookmarked, whether it's a YouTube video that processes the transcript and does it uh, to the transcript, or if it's a a medium article or or blog post or whatever, it will just uh, pull the best stuff out of it. And uh, you can tag uh, these pieces of content that you've uh, bookmarked and, and, uh, do all sorts of stuff. So I share my account, my login, uh, to Readwise Reader with my team so that they can pull stuff from that and create a draft of my weekly newsletter from, from my, uh, my, uh, subscribers. And it's amazing because each week I put out a Thursday three newsletter. So three things that, uh, w- one intrigued me, one that inspired me and one that challenged me. And I don't have to write them. My team does it. And they use Readwise Reader as the source of inspiration for those things that are intriguing and and challenging and surprising. I used to review every single one of those before it would get published. And then I realized I had such a high-performing team, I didn't have to do that anymore. So I got out of the way and stuff just publishes. I have no idea what I'm writing a quote unquote writing in my weekly newsletter. <laughs> so occasionally I'll, I'll look at it, but not, not usually. Yeah. I find that a lot of times people, you know, when they're in the service industry, they, they struggle with building a team. They struggle with finding the right people. So what did you do to kind of find those right people for you and kind of build that team? Uh, a lot of it has to do with trust. I mean, there's process and systems and, uh, you know, having qu- I don't know, like tests and, and, and assessments and things like that. Yes, that's, that's part of it. But a lot of it has to do with that thing that we talked about earlier of just kind of trusting that the path is already laid out for you and just allowing it. You know, your business partner, I believe, was uh, assigned to you and, and you guys chose each other 
before even, you know, coming into the earth. So if that's how it works, which I believe to be true, then I just need to get out of my own way. I mean, yes, I, I have systems and checks and balances and all that sort of stuff too. I'll, we'll, we'll uh, for example, do a, an assessment on a, a new likely hire, have them do Colby assessment, Strengths Finder, and a couple others like um, Dr. Martini's uh, values determination process. And um, I forget, there's just, there, there's a few others. And, and, you know, we'll pay for all that. But I, I think that's an essential. If somebody is likely to be part of my team, I want to know their Colby score. And, and, you know, are they a quick start or are they a fact finder or what? Because that will help me to leverage them to the best their best ability and not try to jam a square peg in a round hole. And I want to do that before I've hired him, <laughs> make sure I'm making the right hiring decision. But also I rely a lot on my intuition, as you know. I love that. I, love, I mean, you know, hasn't led us astray yet, right? I don't know. And even if it did, it was probably supposed to happen. So, <laughs> Yeah, even being led astray uh, is meant to happen too. That's the that's crazy thing. You know, it's like the, the biggest mistakes and, and uh, screw ups in my life have been my biggest teachers. So I think that's probably the case for most of us, if not all of us, right? If you could avoid all those mistakes and do it all differently, would you? I personally wouldn't because I've learned such incredible lessons. I've lost a lot of money making some big mistakes and so forth, but the learning is invaluable. And to not have that learning means you could end up making a much bigger, more costly mistake later on. One of the craziest things to me when I think back on my life is how one change decision could absolutely just change the the direction of my life. I could have ended up in a completely different place. And it's just so crazy when I think about, when you think about everything that had to lead up until you being here, you know, I think that's crazy, but even me being here and like seeing where I'm at now, if I would have made one decision different, like I might not have met my wife or, and if that didn't happen, then I wouldn't have done this. And like, it's just crazy to think that, you know, everything could change just on one decision. You know, my sense of it is that it was already written, you know, like, uh, it was already kind of destined to, to occur that you and your wife would meet. And it's just a matter of, you know, when is that moment? <laughs> what what are the circumstances that bring you guys together? Because it's like she's your 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 co star in your movie, and she was hired to be in your movie as your co star. Whether it's this scene or the next scene, or it's on a train or a bus or a uh, airplane or whatever, it doesn't really matter. It's just that you guys are destined. I forgot where I heard this from Stefan, but like, there's a, there's like a couple different key tells of somebody that you were supposed to meet. And like, I heard this after the fact, after I met her, but like, I just remember when I met her, the sound of her voice was just like, it was so crazy to me. I'd never heard somebody sound like that. And it sounded like, it just sounded like somebody that I was supposed to hear. Like, I just loved the sound of her voice. And then I found out later on that that was actually like a sign of like, you know, uh, of somebody that you're supposed to meet or something. Do you, do you believe in that? Or have you heard of, have you ever heard of that? I haven't heard that, but that, that resonates. Yeah. Okay. So it was just so peculiar, but when I heard her voice, I was just like, man, this sounds like, I don't know. It's just weird. So anyway, I don't know. <laughs> it's just other weird about me. Amazing. I mean, it's just, it's all so magical. I, I, I love this stuff. I love just uh, treating this this life, this reality as a beautiful, elaborate, exquisite video game, movie, play, whatever you want, uh, whatever analogy fits for you. I just love playing the game and feeling like I'm here to make a difference, reveal light, and I'm just looking for the opportunities that the universe is conspiring to make happen for me so that I can do those things that feel uh, on mission for me, the, the revelation of light and making a difference for people. 
I think this podcast was like a oh, has been such a great blend of like business and um you know uh spirituality. Do you find that is there like a um I don't know, a coincidence between people that are in business and spirituality or like I find that a lot of people that are really good at business or like entrepreneur driven type people are also like musicians. I don't know why I've found this like synchronicity, but like it just seems to me that a lot of people that I've met are musicians. Do you ever find do you find any synchronicities like that? Uh, well, I do find synchronicities, but the, uh, what you're describing of people being, um, in the creative arts, I think that makes sense if they're open to their, uh, kind of right brain way of, of, uh, um, experiencing the world. So they like to create, they like to innovate and, and, you know, they're, they're doing that on a regular basis that is going to open up not just their creative centers, but it's going to open up the synchronicities and the, 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 uh, chance kind of coincidences. But if you do this from a place of benevolence, like you want to make a difference in the world, I think that is the secret sauce right there because you'll get way more coincidences, synchronicities, serendipities, whatever, by having this desire to be um, a light in the world. And it's just, a, it, it's like a, a virtuous cycle. More benevolence, more synchronicities, which then gives more, you, you, inspires you to be even more benevolent, which brings you even more synchronicities. And it's just like, the, it, it's like the everyone's in on it <laughs> it's a rigged game and everyone's in on it to m make your life the most uh awesome and and inspiring and and uh i don't know re revelatory as possible yeah maybe what I, I was alluding to maybe some like character traits of like you know business people i don't know i think you're right right brain left brain would be more like logical right yeah, if you're in your head a lot, I was very much like that. Left brain thinking, very analytical, very calculating. <laughs> and, and, and I was not very connected to God. And then I had a spiritual awakening and that opened a lot of additional creativity and brought in a lot of miracles, like without a doubt miracles that are very low chances of occurring. Uh, on their own. And so that's, that's a good sign when you're getting like a one in a trillion kind of chance happening thing, you know, meeting people, you know, in, in a very strange location or whatever, like, what, what are you doing here? This is, that's the weirdest thing. Like, and, and you felt beforehand that you were meant to have a conversation, but you didn't end up having it. And then you, you, you travel hours away and then you run into them again. Uh, <laughs> that's happened. That's fun. It's just, it's a, it's a beautiful game. I love this. Yeah. Just if, if everyone had this desire to want to reveal light and, and cleave to God and to make the world better, uh, there would be world peace and we would just have an incredible, um, you know, like Renaissance. It's kind of a rigged system, though, when you think about uh, the indoctrination of people through schools and stuff like that. So I don't know. But they, like, if that stuff was actually taught, you know, I think it would be a different uh, ball game for us to step in, you know. But I don't know. Maybe we in, in the next podcast, maybe we can just reshape the way that uh, school systems work and then uh, we'll take it from there. I was thinking, what if, what if there was a school system that actually taught like actual skills like if they taught like making food and like how to build things and carpentry, like, I don't know. I, I just wish that that was a scenario that we could live in, you know? Well, it, it is rare, but it does happen. There are some kind of magnet schools or uh, special schools that have a very open-minded curriculum and uh, you just have to be on the hunt for it. But there's one that was um, it's here locally in, in the Miami area, uh, Kentner Academy, that I just happened to see in the Wall Street Journal uh, get a whole feature story earlier in the year. And I felt like, ah, this is a school I should uh, tour for my son. 
Uh, he's not going there at this point. It, it, it's too far away for us to travel on a daily basis, you know, like 45 minutes or 50 minutes each way. But what uh, an incredible school that would um, uh, be written up in the Wall Street Journal for being so innovative and everything. It was just really impressive. So there are schools out there and you can also homeschool. I have an episode on my uh, other podcast on Get Yourself Optimized, where I interviewed an author, an expert on homeschooling. And we talked all about the different kinds of uh, schooling systems besides public schooling, obviously, which is the the worst of the bunch. But there's Montessori, there's Waldorf, there's Ed, uh, what is it, Reggio or something like that. And, and uh, a few others. And then, of course, homeschooling and unschooling and yeah, there's always there are always options. Like you can in, you, you can invent something amazing for your kids and have them uh, get exactly the kind of education that you wished you would have gotten when when you were a kid. It's all possible. Everything's possible. Steffi, can I ask you a quick question that I think maybe would help your audience out a lot? Okay. We were kind of talking about like before this, all the previous episodes and stuff like that. What do you think is like some of the most impactful advice that you've gotten from doing this podcast uh, from a business perspective? Gosh, uh, that's really hard. (laughs) That's hard. I I can't (laughs) pinpoint just one thing, but I'll give you just a, a, a handful that just popped for me. One is um, I learned about non-dominant handwriting and how that can access your creative center, like, like your right brain. Uh, that that episode was um, Bill Donius. Okay, so that was Bill Donius. That was episode two hundred four, and uh, yeah, that that's that's kind of a game changer there. If you tap into your creative center, your your right brain, your verbal center is uh, on the left brain the left hemisphere. So if you listen to the thoughts in your head, then that's coming through on on the left hemisphere. So if you write with your non-dominant hand with the intention to just receive something, you'll write something completely different than what you would have written down otherwise. Like, oh, what do I need to do today? Or um, let's brainstorm some marketing campaigns and then just have your, for me, left hand start writing. You'd be surprised what you can come up with. So that's just one uh, example. Let's say for, um, oh, what would be another example of an episode? Um, I really liked Seth Godin's episode. He really shared stuff in that interview that I don't normally hear him say. So that, that was really inspiring uh, to to hear his take on kind of met, more metaphysical topics. Um, I can't point to anything in particular uh, from that episode that was uh, game changing, but ha- being able to have that kind of powerful conversation with such a thought leader and 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 uh, world changer as Seth, and and ask him anything and then get answers that he's probably never given before that's pretty special that's my favorite part as an interviewer is asking like really piercing questions that like just you know allows people to express things that they haven't been able to before you know yeah and and some people just podcast to interview their prospects and then they get business from it. You know, that's, that's fine too. There are lots of ways to uh, monetize a podcast or leverage a podcast for business building. For me, I just feel like it's part of my mission to spread light in the world. And then I just rely on my intuition as to who I have on and, and when and for which show and, and what questions to ask and all that. I love that. I love. It. I didn't mean. I didn't mean to put you on the spot either with the uh, with the question. But you know, when you've interviewed as many people as you have, like you know, I'm sure you've got a lot of good. Yeah, it's been like eight hundred, you know? <laughs> over eight hundred guests. 
<laughs> crazy. Yeah. So yeah. I'm trying to pick one episode where it's like, yeah, that was that was a game changer. Actually, I'll give you one example, but it has nothing to do with marketing. It was on my other show. It was on Get Yourself Optimized. I interviewed a, a, a psychic medium and I'd never gotten a reading before. Uh, it wasn't a thing that I was really. Did she read you on the uh, on the podcast? Uh, it was a guy. And what he did, because well, he was also a, you know, like an ad guy, an advertising guy, copywriter and so forth. So when I met him in a, a mastermind called Metal, and he uh, it was a Zoom breakout room, and, and he mentioned just in passing that he was also a psychic medium. And it's like, what, what, what was that last part? I just felt like I had to have this guy on and, and I had cleared my schedule so that I could move to Florida. I was in California at the time. And, and so I didn't have any interviews over like a three or four week time period, but I felt like I had to have him on. And at the very hour that I had him on, a family member was having a, my family member was having a stroke and did not believe it and was refusing to go to the hospital to get checked. And we lived very far away from this person. So we didn't have a whole lot of influence to make this, this person go to the hospital. But the psychic medium, his name is Mark Nelson, saved her life because he told me with no uncertain terms that, yes, this person's having a stroke. Here's what's going to happen if, uh, if uh, this person doesn't go to the hospital. And uh, yeah, so that was enough of a, a push for me to make sure that this person went to the hospital and sure enough yep it was a stroke that's something that you'll never forget you know it's meant to be it was meant to be and what are the odds that it would be at the very hour that this person was having the stroke that i was doing the interview and my my wife knew that i was interviewing a psychic medium because i asked her if she had any questions for him prior to the uh interview starting well she inter intervened or interrupted in the middle of the interview sl slid a piece of paper to me and asked me to ask him uh to confirm what was happening to this family member and yeah it was a stroke so saved her life wow that is so um it's so cool to me to like how people read energies and stuff i don't know how they do it it's like very i don't know so have you read any books or anything on that uh, subject matter Oh yeah, 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 <laughs> yeah, plenty. Um, so one book that is um, uh, kind of, it's on that topic of of healing. It's called Hands That Heal. It's by Echo Bodine. It's a good one. I also like the book by her from um, on intuition. It's called A Still Small Voice. The, the psychic's guide to to uh, receiving intuition. I've I've had her on my other podcast. I've had Echo Bodine on on Get Yourself Optimized. Yeah, she's phenomenal. So those are two books that uh, have really been profound for me to read. Uh, there are so many books that I've read on on spirituality, on um, psychic, whatever, healing, whatever. You know, this I. That's an area of, of study for me. I've been trying to make it a habit of every time somebody re recommends a book of just buying it. And then like, I'm trying to build my library up. And then, so I'll just have a whole bunch of books. I'm, it's harder for me to read them as fast as I get them. But, uh, you know, you never, you might not ever hear that good book recommendation again. So I don't want to lose it, you know? Yeah. But you also have to be discerning because not every book recommendation is worthy of your time. That's true. That's very true. So you got to listen. You got to go into your into your heart and listen with your heart. Does this feel right? Does this resonate? And if it doesn't, then don't bother. Right. I only get the ones where people are like, "This one changed my life," or like, "This was like a must read." And I'm like, "All right, you know." But I I completely agree. You have to be discerning. All right. Well, thank you for such a great uh, fun interview. And if our listener is interested in learning from you and getting coaching from you going through your your coaching program and and taking your courses and so forth where should we send them yeah they can check out a pwcourse.com um specifically for um anything related to service industry if you guys are interested in any like youtube coaching that, that i do could um you know just send me a message on instagram at um forever self-employed so awesome thank you justin 
You're an inspiration. Thank you so much, Stephen. I appreciate it. <laughs> and thank you, listener. You have to go out there now and apply some of this amazing wisdom that you've learned today from Justin and uh, make your life better and those of people you love. And we'll catch you in the next episode. I'm your host, Stefan Spencer, signing off.